Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. That's where we're going to be today. We've been walking through the book of Ephesians together. And my plan for the next several weeks is to really slow down here in this section and to kind of move slowly through the rest of chapter 4 and the first half of chapter 5. Because he's going to give us these sort of quick, almost bullet point kind of commands of how we ought to live. So because of all that Christ has done, because we are now in this one body together, Jew and Gentile, everybody joined together in love and faith, because of that, now he's going to give us all these things we ought to do together for one another and as people who have put off this old self and put on the new self, which is Jesus. And so the first one today is speak the truth. So let me read this to us. We're just going to do verse 25, and then we'll seek to understand this together. So he says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Pretty straightforward. Having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So here's the main idea today. Christians should tell the truth. Christians should tell the truth. And you think, yeah, well, yeah, duh. And I hope that that is what you think because that's becoming less obvious. Let's, let's break this down together. There are two phrases in this verse that I want us to understand. First, we have, therefore, having put away falsehood. So that's number one there. Christians should tell the truth because we have put away falsehood. That's number one. We have put away falsehood. This is the foundational idea of this verse, that we have put away falsehood already. And it calls us back to verses 21 and 22, which says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That same verb is used there to be put off apotithemi in verse 22 as well as verse 25 here. And it, and it includes now falsehood in that putting off of the old self. Because as we put off the old self, we're putting on the new self. It's that idea of taking off clothes or taking off a coat that is filthy and disgusting and putting on the new coat, which is Christ. Galatians 3.27 says this explicitly. It says, as many, as, you, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's a different verb there, but it's the very same idea that we are putting on Christ. And as we saw in verse 21 last week, the truth is in Christ. And more than that, he is the embodiment of truth. And so in Christ, who is the truth with a capital T, we have or should have already put away falsehood. But I want to break this down here even further, because the idea that Jesus is the truth is so important for us and for this command for us to be people of the truth. Because the most, the most clear statement about this from Jesus' own mouth is John 14, 6, I think. Or Jesus, in answer to Thomas, who asks him, because Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And Thomas says, where are you going? Like, God, uh, Lord, we don't, we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And what he's saying there is, if you want to live, if you want to have that which is truly life, if you want to know and see God, there is only one way, and it's me. I am the way, and I am the truth. And this is a little bit of an expansion on what John has already said in John 1.14, where he speaks of Jesus and says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. One of the essential elements of God is his total and complete truthfulness. And so to see the glory of God in Christ is to experience complete truthfulness without any lie or error or darkness or mistake. Listen to how the author of Hebrews describes God's absolutely true nature. He says in in 6.13, When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. 
So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. So what he says is that when God made the promises to Abraham, we got to see a glimpse of his perfect truth in two ways. He swore on himself, like by his own inimitable perfection, his own truthful and unchanging nature. That's the second piece, his unchangeableness. He swore by his own unchangeableness. Because God doesn't change, and he can't change. He knows everything already. He doesn't learn. He doesn't gain new information. He cannot fall. He cannot fail. He is ultimate reality and truth. And so he cannot lie, which I think is an interesting phrase. It's not that he's saying God will not lie or God does not lie. God cannot lie. Like the very nature of who God is makes it impossible for God to lie. And so Christ then, being God, took on flesh, dwelt among us, and in him we get to see that fullness of God on display. And what John says was displayed for us is grace and truth. Or maybe another way we could say it is truth mediated through grace. And in that process, the truth doesn't change and it doesn't get blurred or compromised. But God in his mercy cautiously and graciously dispenses the truth to us through the many perfections of Jesus. And not in a way that overwhelms us or destroys us, but in a way that builds us up and encourages us and challenges us for the better. And so if we have truly put our faith in Christ, then we have put on Christ. And if we have put on Christ, we have put off falsehood necessarily. And so then comes the second phrase. Therefore, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, because we are members one of another. And so now because of our new identity in Christ, and because of who and what we have become in Jesus, number two is, now we tell the truth to our neighbor. That's the big number two if you're taking notes. Now we tell the truth to our neighbor. Now we tell the truth to our neighbor. And I don't think that just means other Christians either, although certainly that includes other Christians. But that word neighbor is wider than that, right? It's like Jesus, when Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and the lawyer there asks him, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells him the story of the Good Samaritan, and in this roundabout Jesus kind of way, he says, dude, everybody's your neighbor, and the people you like the least are the people who are neighbor most to you. And I think everybody who heard that was just baffled. Because they're like, I'm supposed to love my enemies? And then Jesus later on says, love your enemies, for in doing this you'll be like your Father who's in heaven. And so, in the same way, we're supposed to share the truth, be the truth, live the truth, tell the truth to everybody. Especially to other Christians, which is why he says we're members one of another, right? He's, he's appealing to an even even deeper quality of relationship that we have with other believers to say, hey, if we're all people of the truth together, we got to be telling the truth to each other. But that brings up an important question and a question that you, you might, I hope you think is obvious, but it's one that we have to try and answer because the world is falling apart around us. And that is this question, what is truth? What is truth? Here's the dictionary definition, and I think this is perfect. It's that which is in accordance with fact or reality. That's from the, the concise Oxford English Dictionary. It's my favorite one because it's concise. But it's that which is in accordance with fact or reality. In other words, that which is real or actual. And I think that's the heart of it. That telling the truth is speaking in a way that you're reporting what is real and factual, right? Not stuff that's made up, not stuff that is wishful thinking, but what is real, what is real. And hopefully you hear that and think, well, duh, we know what the truth means, right? I hope you know that. I hope that that's obvious to you, but I think it's important that we nail it down because the word truth is getting misused and twisted when it's not being dismissed altogether in our culture today. And maybe you've heard this phrase, speak your truth. Do you, you heard that? Maybe you said that, speak your truth. And it usually means something like this, like communicate your needs and your boundaries and your convictions and your ideas and your opinions as only you can. But that's what I think it's usually meant, like report your subjective sense of your needs and boundaries and convictions and ideas. 
And we can make the argument, and I think we should, that there is a time and a place for communicating those things. Right? Boundaries and convictions and opinions and ideas, they matter. And all of us have them, and they are important. But none of those things are truth. None of those. Notice, boundaries, convictions, opinions, ideas. Those are subjective realities within us, but they are not the truth. They are not the truth. They are our perspective and our perceptions. But in themselves, they aren't the truth. And the way that they're being fronted, those things are being fronted as the things that matter most today. They're starting to undermine and ignore the fact that there is a truth. There is an actual objective reality that we're all trying to find or that we should be trying to find. But more and more, and maybe you've experienced this, we're living in a, in a post-truth world, so to speak, where people are saying, well, we don't need this idea of truth anymore. And where philosophers who are so open-minded that their brains have fallen out have convinced a lot of people that the truth isn't real. And that the very concept of truth is a myth. And people are starting to believe that there really is no such thing as an objective reality that exists outside of our own perceptions. And that whatever I believe and see, that is what is true. But that's, that's crazy. And we know that. And the consequences of that have been tragic. This month especially, I think we're, we're seeing that that's how we've gotten to this strange place where men are claiming to be women and vice versa. And not just claiming to be women, right, but demanding that everybody else believes it too and calls them women and uses their preferred pronouns and pretends that their subjective experience of the world is the determining factor for the truth. And that demand is equivalent to demanding that we all ignore what is real and what is actual. But the problem is that there is still such a thing as the truth. And whether we like it or not, there is a real world of facts and reason and moral duties. There is a reality that is coming for us and our incorrect assumptions and ideas. And eventually we're all going to slam into it. And if your life is built solely on your truth or what we might call maybe your carefully crafted rejection of the truth, then when you slam into reality, it hurts. And it's going to shock you. And you're going to be left reeling and injured and maybe hopeless and lost. And no matter how much we ignore it, there is still a reality and a truth outside of us. And so to come back to the command for our passage today, to speak the truth, that has to mean more than just don't lie. Right? Obviously, since lying is the direct opposite of speaking the truth, this does mean on a basic level, don't lie. But he's saying more than that. He's not just saying don't lie. He's saying, now we also tell each other the truth. We speak the truth with one another. But if the truth is that which accords with fact or reality, then it means we have to be people who are proclaimers of the truth. And not in a mean way where we bash people over the head with it. That's not the hope or the idea ever. We don't use the truth to insult or hurt people. But it means we want to warn and encourage people with the objective truth that exists outside of our own heads. And that we get to become now active participants in this sort of collective project of trying to understand more and more of reality and truth. Because as Jesus said in John 8.32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so if that's what truth is, then the next question becomes, how can we know the truth? How do we know what's true? We live in a great time for information. But it's not necessarily a great time for truth. And here's what I mean. Pretty much all of us have a handheld supercomputer, which connects us to the majority of collective human knowledge of all history, which is just amazing. Like my grandmother had a set of encyclopedias. And by the time that she got them in the mail, there was information that was already outdated in them. Isn't that an interesting thought? And here we have literally pretty much access to most of human knowledge within five seconds. The problem is that it is sometimes difficult to know whether that constant flow of information is true or not. And that's what the, the postmodern, post-truth philosophers are kind, of, are kind of playing with. This idea that, well, because human information has a human bias, that means we can't actually know what's true or not. That's what they say. And so we shouldn't try. And so the truth just escapes our grasp. And what really matters is the observer and the, 
and the perspective that you have and your truth. And it's not a totally crazy idea. Like I said, every human is biased. You know that. No, nobody is perfect. None of us is infallible. And so is the information that we receive from other humans. It's, it's biased. It's a little bit tainted by people's perceptions and ideas and, and whatever. And so what do we do? Do we just throw everything away and assume that everybody's a little bit wrong about everything and so we should just abandon truth entirely? Obviously not. Obviously not. Because we, we have, thankfully, because of God's gifts to us, some other amazing abilities that we call observation and reason. We can see things happening, and we can observe the way things work, and we can try stuff and see what happens, and we can come to conclusions about how the world works based on the things that we see. And we can trust other people based on people that we know and their trustworthiness in the past and their wisdom and all of that. We can all get a lot of truth that way. And in fact, that's the basis of what we call the scientific method, that you, you have an idea, you do an experiment, you see what happens, and then you draw some conclusions, and then you try something else. And we've gotten a lot closer to a lot of truth through that method. Like medicine and physics and chemistry and biology are all forms of truth. They're imperfect, but we're striving toward what's real, and we're getting closer. So that's number one. Use your eyes and your mind. How do you know what's true? You use your eyes and you use your mind. God gave us those things, right? I think among some Christians, there's this idea that anything that's not in the Bible is not true. And it's like, well, we can't live that way, right? You can't build a house. You can't, you can't go to the doctor. You can't. There's so many things you can't do if you say only what's in the Bible is true. And so I think we all recognize on some level, God has given us eyes and reason and minds so that we can piece together bits of the truth. Part of what's going on, I think Satan has convinced all of us to just don't believe what your eyes tell you. And that's crazy, right? That, that is crazy. If you see something, if you experience something, if you find out that something works, that is a piece of the truth. And that is, that is important. Now, our minds are fallen, and so our reason is not perfect, and sometimes we come to incorrect conclusions, but that is a form of truth. But there are deeper truths, too, and truths that we can't just see or observe or reason our way to. And there are some truths that have to be revealed to us by the truth himself. And so Jesus says that here's how we know truth that is infallible. That is to, number two, read your Bible. Read your Bible. If you want to know the truth, read your Bible. Here's John 8, 31 and 32. I mentioned a piece of this a second ago. But Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so Jesus says, if you want to know what is really true, and what is deeply true, and what is unchangeably true, you got to read the Bible. Because all that we can observe and see, all the scientific conclusions we come to, those have a sort of a practical value. Like I said, we can do medicine, we can build houses, we can, all the things that chemistry has given us, those are because we have developed these scientific truths. But there are questions that we can't answer on our own, that only the Bible can give us the answers to. Questions like, who is God? What is he like? What is the purpose of life? And so Jesus says, if you want to know the truth, abide in his word. In John 17, when he's praying the, what's called the high priestly prayer over his disciples, and then as by extension over us, what he says, he asks the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so if you want to know the truth, read your Bible. And if you want to see into the mysteries of God, meditate on the word of God. And if you want to see the glory of the Lord, fill your heart and your mind with his word. That is the place that he reveals himself most fully to us. We know from Romans 1 that, that there are pieces of God that we get a glimpse of in nature. Uh, Paul says his divine nature and his, his eternal power are revealed in the things that have been made. And they're revealed to the point that all of us are without excuse that we should know God. But we can know that God exists without knowing him, if that makes sense. And so if you want to know him, 
If you want to know the truth with a capital T, and you want to be grounded to real reality, fill your heart and your mind with the Word of God. If you want to be wise, read your Bible. And I'm not saying that you read the Bible and then you wish and hope that it's true because you really want it to be. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. The Bible doesn't need you to do that either. It is true. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. Every word proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And I love that phrase, that the, every word of God proves true. Because it is honestly amazing. The more I read and understand the word of God, the more I see its truth everywhere. The more I see it worked out in the world. And the more I see people rejecting the truth of the word of God, the more destruction I see them bringing on themselves and other people. Like here in the United States and most of Western Europe too, we have built the most peaceful, prosperous civilization ever. And we did it on the basis of the word of God. Like equality under the law and the innate value of every human being and private property and personal responsibility, just sitting a few things, those are biblical values. And we take those things for granted, but they find their source in the Bible. And the moral life that the Bible describes, that is the standard for all of humanity. And we pretty much all agree on the vast majority of it. Now, obviously, there are pieces that the world is, around us is starting to reject, and that our country is starting to walk away from, particularly like sexual morality. Like We've seen that happening. People say, well, God was wrong about this. But we who know that the word of the Lord proves true, we have a responsibility to hold on to that. And so if you want the truth, read the Bible and learn it and memorize it and live it. And then go and look at the world that God has made. So many things in nature are amazing. And the more that we do real science, again, let me, I, I like to make a distinction here. I don't want to run off on a rabbit trail. But real science is the stuff we observe, okay? The stuff we observe is trustworthy. Again, we should be able to trust our eyes. If we can't trust our eyes, what can we trust? But then there's this kind of thing where people have taken the, the observable truths, let's say, of science, and they've run with those to far extents that aren't founded and aren't observed and aren't truly known. They're conjecture. They're, they're, they're educated guesses. But the real truth, the stuff that we can see, and then better and more and more founding and solid, the stuff that's in the Bible, that is the stuff we should be anchoring our souls to. And we should be people of the truth who speak the truth with everyone. And so then here's this last question that I don't want to I don't want to leave today without addressing, and that is this one. Is it ever okay to lie? Is it ever okay to lie? Because if we're supposed to be people of the truth. Does that mean we should do something like radical honesty? I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but there's this, this idea that some people take and run with of radical honesty where they speak their mind all the time. Don't do that. Okay, don't do that. Like I said, we don't want to bludgeon and hurt people with the truth. But then, is it ever okay to tell something, to say something that we know for certain is not true? And you may say, well, obviously not, but I think this is an important question to consider because I think all of us, if we take a minute, can imagine a couple of terrible situations where you might be forced either to lie or to, if you don't lie, then to cause or allow something worse to happen. The classic example that comes up is like Christians who were in Germany in the 1930s and 40s who hid their Jewish friends and neighbors in the attics and crawl spaces of their homes and then when the Gestapo came asking if they had any Jews in their homes, what do you do as a Christian? What should they have done? What would you do? What does God expect us to do? Here are two stories from the Old Testament that I think shed some light on this. The first one is the Hebrew midwives from Exodus chapter 1. Just to set this up for us, the Egyptians have enslaved the Israelites at this point, And they've made them work unbelievably hard labor and yet God is still with them and has been multiplying them to the point that they outnumber the Egyptians and the Egyptians are afraid of how many people there are and so Pharaoh the king in verse 15 it says the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah 
When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the male children live. And so the king of Egypt called the midwives and said, Why have you done this and let the male children live? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous, and they give birth quickly before the midwife comes to them. And so God dealt with the midwives, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And so what's happening here, the king gives them a command, an evil and terrible command to kill every baby boy that is born. But the midwives did the right thing and they disobeyed the king and they obeyed God instead because they feared God more than they feared the king. But they didn't just disobey the king. They also lied to the king and they told the king a different story. Instead of saying, they could have said, well, you're evil and so we disobeyed your terrible command. And then the king would have probably killed them and put somebody else in their place maybe. I don't know. But what they did instead is they tell the they tell the king, well, the, the Hebrew women, they give birth quickly. They're more vigorous. They're not like Egyptian women. They don't linger in labor. And so they give birth before the midwife comes. But that's not true. And we know it's a lie because we've already been told that they did not do what the king of Egypt commanded them. And most of the time, the Old Testament stories, they're presented without any comment from God. Right? God is present in the background, but God doesn't speak or do anything. And we don't We're never told whether this thing was right or wrong. And there's so many stories from the Old Testament like that. That bad things happen or good things happen and they are reported but not commented on. But here, we have the direct response from God in verse 20 that says, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And so their lie was not just allowed by God, God rewarded them for that lie. Here's another story. Rahab and the spies in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua sends spies into the land of Canaan, especially to Jericho, because that is the next city on their list. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they stayed there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they've come to search out all the land. So like the king knows. People see them go in. The spies go into her house. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they were from. And then when the gate was about to be closed at dark, they left. I don't know where they went, so go after them quickly and you can overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. And then skip down to chapter 6, after the defeat of Jericho, in verse 22, it says, To the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all of her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city of Jericho with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And and unless we start to think that maybe, well, that was just Joshua. I don't know. Here's James. Here's what James says about Rahab. He says, in the same way, In the same way, by the way, as Abraham, who was willing to sacrifice Isaac as a working out of his faith. He says, in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And so what I'm I'm seeing here, what what I'm saying is God rewarded these two instances of lies. These were lies. They were falsehoods. They were untruths. And they were rewarded. And not just rewarded 
in the case of Rahab, upheld as an example of what real faith looks like. That sometimes you lie to the king in order to protect the innocent. And so what am I saying? That lying is good? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we live in a fallen world. And sometimes, because we live in a fallen world, we are allowed and even expected to do things that in Eden would not have been necessary. And just like sometimes we have to fight, or even in terrible situations to kill in order to protect those who are innocent, now just like violence, lying has a very, very, very limited place in the Christian life. And the default for Christians should be to speak the truth. That is the overwhelming testimony of Scripture. But the ninth commandment is you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. But we should absolutely never lie to harm somebody else or to get something that we wouldn't otherwise get or because we don't want people to find out something about us. But to protect life, and especially innocent life, if you are ever in that terrible, terrible situation, very rare and very terrible situation, sometimes you lie. And sometimes that is the right thing to do. And sometimes telling the truth would be a sin because it would make you party to greater evil but only very, very rarely. And so to answer the question, is it ever okay to lie? Yes, but very rarely. Those are the blanks there. Yes, it is, but only very rarely. God has called us to holiness, not to stupidity. He has called us to wisdom, not to um, rigid fundamentalism, so to speak. Not to, God has given us the law, to guide us, to teach us, to lead us into righteousness. But there are certain situations where certain commands of God outweigh others. And I think we know what those are. We've talked about some of these before. But in a case where a government, like we're, we're called to obey the government, but in a case where the government calls us to do something that God has said don't do, we obey God instead. And in the same way, if somebody asks us to tell a truth that is going to cause us to, to disobey God in some other serious way, well, then in that case, we withhold that truth or we bend it for the glory of God, not for the glory of ourselves. And that calls for wisdom and judgment, but there are situations where that's okay. But to come back to the, the, the bigger, more overarching point, 99.9% of your life should be truth. Now, maybe 99.999% of your life should be truth. We should be people of the truth, people who proclaim the truth, people who live the truth, people who own the truth, people who defend the truth, because the truth himself has come to set us free from falsehood and to rescue us and to redeem us and to drag us into the light, which burns sin off of us and causes us sometimes to lose friends and relatives And other people who we love, and yet calls us in to love himself. And if standing for and holding on to the truth makes us lose other things, well then so be it. But as people who have put on Christ, may we be, by God's grace, people of the truth. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you are sanctifying us in the truth. We thank you that your word is truth, that we can trust it, that it has no mixture of error, that it is pure and true and right and worthy of our devotion and our meditation and our reading and our memorizing. Lord, give us a hunger and a thirst for your word. Help us to see your truth everywhere. Lord, may we be people of the truth. Lord, those of us who have put off the old self and put on Christ, Lead us into the truth. Shine the truth through us and out of us. Lord, may we never be ashamed of the truth. And may we never, ever, ever give it up or compromise it or walk away from it. Lord, if there's anyone here today who is far from you, or who is hurting, or who is unsure or doubting, Lord, I ask today that you would open their eyes to see your truth, to see you everywhere to see your fingerprints on all of creation and to see your glory in the scriptures that you've given us. 
Lord, we know that that is a work that only your spirit can do, and we ask that you would do it, that you would give faith to those who lack it, that you would convict those who are dead in their sins, Lord, and that you would draw them, as only you can do, to Christ who offers us life and life abundantly, to the truth and the way and the life. Lord, we love you today, as always, and we ask that today especially you would make us people of the truth. We need you for this, and we know this is what you want, and so we ask that you would do it for us and for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.